If you'll indulge me, I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes saying something about Energy Futures Lab for those of you who are not familiar with us as, as an organization, as a part of Imperial College. This is the eighth of our annual lectures, so it gives you some idea about how long the Energy Futures Lab has been established as an institute uh, at Imperial College. Um, though I have to say, I've only been director of it since February. I was lucky enough to inherit a, a robust and energetic organization from my predecessor and very pleased to take on this role. And the role really is for, to help Imperial College tackle energy um, research topics in the broadest um, possible definition. Um, I think that's best described perhaps in terms of examples. I mean, we can look at uh, carbon capture and storage technology and know that across the college we have expertise in the chemistry and the chemical engineering to tackle the processes, in the earth sciences to look at um, storage um, sites, to think about the dynamics of the process plants that, uh, that form the capture system and how that affects the operation of an electricity uh, supply system and we can tackle the economics and the policy implications of, of, of carbon capture as a technology. I think we can look across the piece at photovoltaics and storage systems and various other energy um, questions and see the same breadth of expertise that we can harness as an organization. And, and the role of the Energy Futures Lab is to take people based in discipline, um, organized departments and bring them together to conduct research. And I think it's also important to note that we have a role in the education as well to make sure that our teaching at master's level and PhD level in particular enables students to benefit from a wide view of energy, not just the particular topics they've chosen to specialize in, but through events that we organize to, to be exposed to the wider energy debate. Um, and indeed to be able to communicate those outcomes then to both industry and to um, policy makers. It's been a busy year for us. Um, a lot of the activity, of course, I've inherited from my predecessor, but I think it's worth remarking on, on some of the successes, particularly around the en energy storage area. Uh, large um, activity has been funded, both in terms of research support from the research councils and in terms of equipment and in terms of organizing the hub that brings together storage research across the UK. Um, we've also last week just launched the BG supported Sustainable Gas Institute um, and that will be a, a large program of research which has a particularly interesting international dimension um, particularly uh, interacting with with Brazil. Um, we are just in the process of trying to put together um, some position on the controversial topic of the use that the UK should make of shale gas and again I think it's interesting that we can tackle that from a process and technology standpoint from a geological um, sciences standpoint, from the water use and water um, purity standpoints and the economics and the uh, policy implications. And we shall shortly be doing something similar now for smart energy systems, trying to combine um, what we know about transport and human behavior in the transport environment and in the built environment together with the interactions with, the, with electricity systems. So um, I think that gives you a flavor of, of what we do and what we set out to do. I think tonight's lecture is uh, a part of that. You will see a broad view of, of, a, of a transport topic. This is our prestige event of the year, so I'm very pleased to see such a, um, a good turnout for the event, and it's my pleasure now to ask Jeff McGee, Principal of Faculty of Engineering, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Can I borrow the mic? Sure. <clears throat> it's my privilege as uh, principal or uh, dean no, of the Faculty of Engineering, we changed titles recently, uh, um, to welcome you to this lecture and introduce Dr. Wolfgang Eppel. I was very pleased in, in doing a little bit of uh, background reading for this and research that uh, the reason that uh, uh, Dr. Eppel has the title doctor is that he did his uh, PhD in computing science, in fact, at the University of Karlsruhe some time ago. Um, I say this because I also have um, a PhD in computing science, and I say this especially for the mechanical engineers, more mechanical engineering here in the audience, as further proof for my contention, sometimes disputed, that computing science is also an engineering discipline. Thank you. 
Dr. Apple uh, currently leads uh, Jaguar Land Rover's research and development technology activities, and he's been with J uh, Jaguar Land Rover since uh, June 2012 when he joined as director of product programs. Dr. Ebel joined uh, JLR from uh, Proton, the leading Malaysian car manufacturer, who also now own the Lotus brand. Um, while he was there, he was senior director for engineering, um, purchasing, manufacturing, and quality assurance. And uh, since that didn't occupy enough of his time, at the same time, he uh, headed up development of a new auto platform, a new automobile platform. So uh, before uh, Proton, uh, Dr. Apple spent 24 years uh, at um, BMW, primarily in research and development. And uh, during that period, he was CEO and president of BMW Hybrid Technology Corporation in Michigan, USA, where he was involved in the de development of uh, hybrid propulsion modules. Uh, tonight, I think we will benefit from Dr. Apple's enormous experience in the car industry and I particularly look forward to his insights in the future of energy and passenger vehicles. Dr. Eppel. Thank, thank you very much, Jeff, uh, for the introduction. And I'm amazed uh, very often how much Google knows about me. Uh, because some of uh, the items, uh, I do not know where they came from, but they are there. And that is nowadays world. Now, it's my privilege to use your words as well to be here tonight as your guest speaker. And it's a special honor for, for me and for JLI as well, uh, being invited to this place here, because Imperial is something which is very special. And uh, there are some analogies and something which is similar, I think, between Imperial and what we consider as one of our core values, namely excellence. Now, within the next some 45 minutes, I want to talk to you about the future of energy from our perspective in the car. And there I would like to stress, mention those five topics. Number one, a few words about Jaguar Land Rover, GLR, in the last couple of years and where we are today, uh, both on the product side as well as on the business side. Then secondly, the global energy challenge, which is something which is present, prevalent, everywhere, in each and every corner. Everybody talks about that one. Thirdly, to give you an idea, what we at JLR have done in order to adjust and focus our research activities, and then fourthly, give you a few examples where we have spent energy, time, in order to tackle, in order to take the challenge and move the industry forward in that environment ending then with a conclusion. Now, before I go into the details, I would like to get an idea of you, of the audience. May I ask one question, two questions, and then I would like to see some of your hands. Who of you is part of the university, either as a student or as staff? Hands up. Uh, you have got some 60, 70% market share in the room. <laughs> uh, who is not part of university then? The other. 25%. Thank you. Now, Jaguar Land Rover, the one is the product. Jaguar Land Rover has a long history here in the country. Jaguar started 1922, more or less in the last century, building sports cars. Land Rover on the other side, the famous Series 1, 1948, celebrated last year the 65th anniversary. And then over time, products have been developed and ownerships has, have changed. There was, Jaguar has been acquired by, by Ford in 1989, and then uh, in 2008, during the crisis where Jaguar Land Rover really got as other OEMs in, as well in difficulties. Tata has taken over after any local support or initiative failed. On the Land Rover side, similar way, uh, taking over by Ford in 2000 and then 2008, and then after 2008, Jaguar Land Rover as a fully owned subsidiary of Tata in India.
this is just to give you an idea of the products and the environment, the context where Jaguar Land Rover, the pure British company, currently is operating in. If you go nowadays into a showroom, that is what you would find there, the products of Jaguar Land Rover, and that is what has evolved over the last couple of years, some five, seven years, using platforms from the past and also new platforms in the future, which I will stress and address in a few minutes. In total, there are currently 11 products in the showroom, both Land Rover and Jaguar on the top, the Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, the Evoque on the right-hand side, Discovery, and then below, Freelander and the well-known all over the world, Defender, and then the various Jaguars XF, XJ, and the F-Type. Jaguar Land Rover last year has won some 200 awards all over the world, in different parts of the world. Uh, in total, we export into 140 different countries in the meantime. 80% of the production is going abroad and is, is leaving the island. The various brands, uh, the various cars, they have won on expert assessment, in different parts of the world. We have two solid brands. It's on the one hand side, here mostly Jaguar, the dynamism, the sportiness, uh, the usability in each and every environment, whether it's snow, mud, sand, or whatever it is, Land Rover says above and beyond, whatever you can imagine on the globe to go to, the Land Rover takes you there even through water. Now, that is the product side. As a business, Jaguar Land Rover, some of you might have get the news last week when the annual result has been published, another best year in the history of Jaguar Land Rover. 2.5 million profit has been earned on a turnover of some 20 billion. And luckily, the owner of Jaguar Land Rover Tata fully supports the initiatives, the activities in R&D as well, in research and development, though we will spend, we will invest 3.5 million in the coming business year into products and into facilities, into plants, in order to further progress in our development in our growth. 1.7 million have been spent partly and are currently being spent in Solihull, which is the biggest plant on the globe in aluminum. And there we prepare for another model, which is the small Jaguar, the three series C-class segment, which will be launched then next year. Additionally, over the last three years, the company has grown some 11,000 people which have been employed, graduates, apprenticeships in big numbers, and it's in the meantime 7,000 engineers which work in Gaden and in Whitley in the West Midlands in order to research and develop those products. We have been nominated responsible business in the year and have established taking the green challenge quite a big team for electric and hybrid vehicles. If you look into the sales, the volume over the last five years more or less has doubled from some 200,000 units to 434, 311 cars which have been sold last year. And it's an annual increase of 16 plus percent. Uh, if you look uh, around the globe, then it's the biggest part in China, more than 20 percent, 23 percent in China, uh, Europe, the second one and in total, the 16% growth. As I said, 80% is going to leave UK and is going all over the world. In terms of total numbers, we are small in global terms uh, with a turnover of some 20 billion, 3.5 billion, I said, will be invested. In total, 28,000 people are working directly at Jaguar Land Rover. There are another, around about 80,000 in the supply chain, 
direct OEM suppliers, including some 10,000 in the dealerships. And in total, Jaguar Land Rover relies on 190,000 people in this country that they do their best every day. If they don't, then we fail. Six billion annual purchasing volume in UK. The balance is coming from mostly Europe, uh, Eastern, Central Europe, because, and that is an area where we are challenged. Not all the technologies which we need are available here in the country. And we encourage, catalyze many of our suppliers to come into UK and to build up production sites here in the country that we can benefit and can rely on local sources. If you look into UK, here on the right-hand side, in front of you, the manufacturing sites up north, Liverpool, Gloucester, Liverpool, Halewood, with 4,600 people working there, building Evoke and Freelander. Then further south, Castle Bromwich, the Jaguar plant for XJ, XF, XK, and the F-type. And then Solihull, which is a Range Rover, Land Rover only plant, the new Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, Discovery, and Defender, which are built there. On, sorry, on the right-hand side now, uh, headquarters in Whitley, the engineering center, which housed 6,000 engineers in Gaden with a test track there as well. Um, EMC, an engine plant, which in a couple of months will go in st on stream in Wolverhampton. The EMC engine manufacturing center, where the first engine, it's a four-cylinder engine, developed by JLR and produced by GLR will be manufactured and then go subsequently in the various products. And on the bottom, the research center, which is hosted by University of Warwick, because in the time 2008 to 2013, during the growth of Jaguar Land Rover, there was not enough space and then uh, university has been so kind to host some of our engineers in that area. And that is looking to the future. A joint project which we have decided and agreed upon, we is University of Warwick, the Warwick Manufacturing Center, uh, Tata Motors European Technology Center and Jaguar Land Rover, jointly to build that building, which we call National Automotive Innovation Center, uh, in order to bring together different disciplines, because from our point of view, we are convinced future innovations are not coming from the typical areas we know from the past, from mechanical, electrical, engineering. It's other disciplines and other people who form the future of the automotive industry. And therefore, this building is currently in the planning stage it will be ready by end of 2016 and then host some 1,000 engineers from different companies, different disciplines, different parts of the world. The global energy challenge. Most likely, you know substantially more about that one than I do because you are doing partly research in that area. Uh, what we are challenged every day is how we are going to meet those big global challenges. On the left, the requirements, which are more or less changing by the week, countries, nations, cities, they decide, they make proposals uh, how to address the CO2 emission and how to improve the quality of air on the globe which then usually results in legislation, regulation, we need to cope with. Top right, there are global developments which we experience. We are more or less attached and challenged by them. One of the biggest megacities, 
the forecast for the future is that by 2030, 60% of the world population will live in cities minimum the size of London, more than 10 million. And we can observe occasionally Far East in China what that means in terms of air quality and commuting and traffic. Bottom left, I, we are convinced it's healthy to be in fierce competition because that is what keeps us on our toes, what drives us, and what tells us every day what can be done and what's happening. And I'm personally convinced the fact that the automotive industry is so innovative and has accelerated that one is due to the fact that there are across the channel, there are, we call them the big three of Europe, the big three of Europe who generate that competition, and that is something which is healthy, and Darwin tells all of us, only the fittest survive, those who adopt and find their way. And on the right, the commercial background, yes, we have an owner, and he is very generous with us. He allows us currently to invest what we own. This is one example of the global challenges. If you look on the X horizontal axis, it's the time. On the vertical one, it's gram CO2 per kilometer uh, driven in a car. And if you go back to 2003, then there are two interesting conclusions out of that one. Number one, the CO2 emission has been substantially higher on the globe and the different colors identify the various countries or different parts of the world. And number two, the difference between the highest and the lowest is some 100 grams or 40% of the maximum. If you move further to the right, then by 2030, that is currently what is in the discussion, in the making. That difference will reduce to 19 gram, and the total will go down substantially. There is a big step in 2020, 21 in Europe with 120 grams, and another one which is forecasted for, sorry, current uh, next year with 125, and then 2021, the 95 gram in Europe, and that is supposed to go further down to some 60 gram. And that is something if you just imagine for yourself, average human being, 2,000 kilocalories, kilocalories, reducing that one to half of it or to one third, what that means for an individual. And the car is a system as well, though we need to do various activities and need to be extremely creative in order to achieve those targets. This is the situation today, a diagram which has been produced by ADAC, the German AA, more or less showing the weight which corresponds to the size of the car as well on the bottom between one and 2.5 tons. And on the y-axis, the gram CO2 as well. Though many, many dots, small cars, lightweight, in the 120, 130 area. And then if you go to the right, 200, 270 grams. And the green line showing what the requirement for 2020 and 2015 is. Gives an idea of the challenge the automotive industry is faced with. There are, in general, two different ways how the problem can be addressed. On the one hand side, that's a top bar. Activities, measures in the product in the car, and the other one, the lower one, in the fuel in the resource, reducing the carbon in the fuel which is used. And this is something where the whole engineering community, including 
computer scientists have a tremendous opportunity. <laughs> the waste in the system, two thirds of the energy which is put into the tank is wasted today. And only one third roughly is used in order to move customers, people from A to B or to give them a nice environment while they commute in the traffic jam and keep them cool in tropical countries or warm in cold countries. The globe, the earth, is very kind to us because the sun is there all the time and over millions of years, fossil energies, fuels, have been generated. There are different ways, other ways to produce energy. And the nice thing is that green bar on the side, it's renewable. It can be produced over and over again. And if you go up the bar, then some of the energy can be produced within seconds, <coughs> electrovoltaic. Now, there is a huge hope and a huge potential which we can more or less harvest in the future. I will spend the next few minutes on this chart and then give you some examples for that one in the different categories. It's on the left-hand side, the various sources of energy, fuel, uh, biofuel, different kinds. On the right-hand side, propulsion systems. And in between, and that is something which Ricardo had done a year ago, uh, something which they called the energy vector. Now, if we take the upper part, which is more or less conventional fossil energy, then I did mention that the regulation is changing all over the world. What also changes is the fuel quality and the fuel production. Different parts of the world, they have different plants. In the West, US and Latin America, it's corn. It's sugarcane. Uh, if you go Central Europe, it's wheat. If you go to the east, there's a lot of palm oil, oil and coconut. And if there are some chemists in the room, then they know what the difference is and what the implication if you feed internal combustion engines with different fuel, what that means. I personally, I lived for six years in South Africa. In South Africa, they produce fuel out of coal. And they produce alcohol as well. And depending on the world market price of alcohol, they have added more or less alcohol to the fuel, which then, in the 70s, 80s, in carburetor engines, resulted in, in rust in vehicles. And that is something which is happening in different parts of the world, that there are mixtures, and you do not know exactly what the content of it is. Amazingly, it has grown substantially, the contribution of biofuels to our energy bill and our energy sourcing over the last 10 years has grown tremendously, mostly Mexico, US. And the recent discussion about shale gas tells us, and that picture on the right-hand side is a forecast for yes, which more or less indicates then that by 2030, US would be in a situation where they more or less have 50% of their energy bill sourced out of shale gas. And there are forecasts already now that US might get from an import role into an export role of energy. Secondly, hydrogen. Many people claim that, or mention that hydrogen is clean. Uh, you drive the car using hydrogen, there is no carbon in, though you get water uh, out of the car, out of the exhaust, which most likely is true, but very often there's a second side of the coin as well, and the context is a little bit bigger. Now, what we have done here is uh, showing you for an existing car, 
uh, it's an evoke. On the left-hand side, the CO2 footprint using fossil fuel, it's some 169 grams. The next one shows an EV car with a range of around about 100 kilometers. Uh, that would, if we take the full well-to-wheel CO2 footprint, would generate some 80 gram CO2. If that car can travel 200 kilometers, then it goes up to 92, 93 gram, because you need a battery double the size, almost double the weight. And then if you look at, uh, at hydrogen, then, sorry, there is one bar without a, a color. Uh, that is, if the electricity is uh, produced out of renewables, then you don't have a carbon footprint. If you then go to hydrogen, then it depends as well how the hydrogen is produced, manufactured. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, electrolysis out of the European grid with 350 grams CO2. And on the right-hand side, then more or less renewable. Now, if somebody then says that hydrogen is environmentally friendly, then it's only under certain conditions, uh, under certain assumptions. It depends how you produce the hydrogen. And this more or less gives you the full spectrum of energy, hydrogen energy produced out of different materials. On the bottom right, it's nuclear. Yes, the CO2 footprint is extremely small, uh, close to zero or zero. If it's wood, then also if you use coal on the top, then you get 250, 300, 350 grams. And thirdly, electricity. Electricity is in cars something which we use, and it's not digital on off. It is quite an array of different electrification degrees in the car. In the columns here on the left-hand side, the various functions, and then subsequently those columns identify an increasing level of electrification. The simplest one being start-stop, in the meantime standard in many, many cars. And on the right-hand side, second to last, the electric vehicle. And what is visible here is there is a gradient, and there are many different alternatives how commuting demands and requirements can be fulfilled. Uh, there are hybrid cars in as well, plug-in hybrids, with different ranges and different meeting different expectations. This one makes very often people think twice because it shows on the top the key ingredients to lithium-ion batteries uh, and the energy content of one kilogram. Right on the left, one kilogram lithium-ion is more or less the energy equivalent to 570 watt hours. If that is put into a cell, then you have the housing and you add some additional weight for that one and it goes down to 150 watt hours. If you then put it into a battery, that goes further down to some 80 watt hours. There's a variance plus minus 20% nowadays and every day somebody has found a new formulation for the material for the lithium ion cells, which can store substantially more energy. The principle stays. Uh, if you put it into a battery, you add weight, but you don't get more energy for that one. The price is going directly the opposite. 66 US dollars per kilogram lithium ion. If it's in a battery, then you pay more or less 10 times that amount. Though the price goes up tenfold, the energy content goes down to one seventh. And there's one car which has made a lot of noise in the market, Tesla S. That's the battery of a Tesla S, 80 kilowatt hours total. 
The volume is 380 liters. The weight is 670 kilogram. And it contains 7,104 small cylindrical cells. Now, having so many experts in front of me, may I ask you one question? What do you think is the energy equivalent in fuel? How many little fuels are needed in order to have the same energy like that battery? 80 kilowatt hours. Any number is, is OK. A gallon? A couple, gallon? five, ten? Five. Eight zero. Eighty gallons or eighty liters? Eighty liters, okay. One gallon. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the energy content of one liter fuel is between 12 and 14,000 kilowatt hours. One liter. 80 divided by 12 is round about seven liters. Now, seven liters of fuel contain the same energy content as 380 liters of battery. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is currently the big, the big inhibitor for electric cars. The tremendous energy content of fuel. And Tesla has done a marvelous job for the whole industry because they have built that car with a range in California. It depends on environment conditions with a range of up to 500 kilometers to take away what experts call range anxiety. Nobody wants to drive a car from A to B and get blocked somewhere in between because the battery is flat. Now with 500 kilometers, the range anxiety is gone, but you carry or the car carries a tremendous load. And that energy density in batteries there are a few experts in the room, is something which is over time increasing, but I fear I'm too old to experience a battery with an energy content like fuel. That will take hundred, few hundred years, probably. And therefore, the CO2 challenge has two major components and ingredients. The one is the engineering community who needs to deliver solutions. But at the same time, there is the user community. And the user community also need to think about whether that range of a few hundred kilometers is really something which is needed. And we have done recently some studies in US, Europe, and China. Uh, People's beha people behavior is going to change. Uh, that range anxiety, if somebody has used an electric car for some time, he is suddenly satisfied with a range of 30, 40 miles because that is what he is driving every day. And he doesn't need a, a charging station in front of the supermarket because he or she mostly charges at home because it's so convenient overnight. That is a gradual process and Coming back to the example, the seven liters of energy and the 370 liters is something which the whole engineering community cannot solve within a, a few years. That can only be something which changes with our mindset and our expectation. That gives you an overview of the two players in that field, the one, the left color more or less being the infrastructure, and the right color being the products. And there are few areas, if you go to the bottom line, hydrogen, for example, and fuel cell vehicles, there are cars available. They are driving around in fleets of 100 cars in different parts of the world in order to test the technology to validate 
the infrastructure for that one. Yes, uh, US some four years back, they have announced uh, California has been the first one. Uh, they wanted to have 100 fu hydrogen fuel stations by end of last year. In total, there are some 55. Part of them are more or less private. And it's going very slow because the investment for a hydrogen fuel station is substantially higher than just a fuel station. You can pick any line uh, out of that one. Electric battery vehicles are around and there are more to come in the next two to three years. Infrastructure is not growing with that speed as the supply with cars. And therefore, and that has been forecasted by the European Road Transport Advisory Council, by 2030, the majority, some 80%, 85, will still rely on fossil fuels, fossil or biofuels. Research. I've shown you some of the challenges which we have. There's another one as an OEM, at the car manufacturer, we have got some customers and they have certain requests and demands as well. Therefore, we have focused and aligned our research activities uh, coming from our vision. We want to deliver experiences our customers love for life with the three brands and have identified on that one the five key areas, namely capability, that our products are capable on-road and off-road. Second, clean, that we reduce the CO2 print of all our products. Thirdly, connected. Fourth, it must be a product which is desirable, people like, and last but not least, smart. Now, in terms of capability, it's different for the two brands, uh, Land Rover being some of the motoring press have nominated the Land Rover, the Range Rover, which has been launched in 2012 as king of, of the off-road, uh, being capable that the car can bring you everywhere off-road. On-road, it's the dynamism, it's the sportiness uh, of the Jaguar, of the cat which is inside the Jaguar. Second, clean reduce the CO2 print with each and every generation. And there will come in a minute too, that can be done in three different categories. Connectivity is something which is happening. If you look around here, there's a 90% market share of smart devices in this room. And that is something people expect in, in the future in the car as well. And in addition, connectivity be between cars or between cars and infrastructure can be used in order to control to make more fluid and flowing traffic and hence reducing commuting time. Desirability, it's the design and it's the des delivery to expectations of customers and last but not least, the smart approach which means supporting the driver in tedious tasks in future <coughs> One of the keywords is, or passwords, autonomous driving. Now, in terms of clean, it is the low emission, and I've shown you earlier the requirements and the regulation from different countries. What is happening more and more, that cities imply something which is different. China, Beijing, they want to take a few million cars, old cars, out of the city, or depending on your registration plate, you either can enter Monday or Tuesday. Uh, London sooner or later will have something similar. Now, in order to reduce CO2 for us as a manufacturer, there are three categories we can concentrate on. The one is the propulsion system and the efficiency about in that system. Secondly, it's the weight and thirdly, it's parasites, heat. There are many, many keywords on that one. I will spend a few minutes on those which are green here and give you some ideas about that one. Combustion engine. That is 
the first Jaguar Land Rover designed, developed, and manufactured four-cylinder engine. By the end of the year, being manufactured in Wolverhampton and then more or less getting into all the various cars. It's a state-of-the-art leading top three uh, on the globe in terms of fuel economy, efficiency, and performance. Secondly, hybrid. Land Rover, Range Rover has launched earlier this year uh, the first diesel premium car and that Range Rover hybrid has done a test uh, along the Silk Road and went to, through the various environments, uh, day and night, uh, in sand, in water, uh, in snow, and also in terms of altitude more than 5,000 meters high in a temperature which is pretty low, and the car has mastered it marvelously. Uh, it went also minus 100 meters through the channel. The question people are raising is, though, what can I get from a little fuel? Uh, and that is how it has changed over time, from the 30 miles up to 95 miles with a diesel hybrid Range Rover 2.7 tons. The second one is the weight, and the weight is a virtuous circle. And uh, with the Range Rover, the last Range Rover, previous generation to the current one, there was a weight reduction of 420 kilograms. 50% of that one came out of the body using aluminum, the other 50% downsizing the engine. And this picture top left shows you what can be done with aluminum. An XJ body has the weight of a Mini. It's almost double the size. Weight is something which doesn't come for free. And there, on the left-hand side, it's a steel body. And then if you go to the right, uh, carbon fiber, CFRP stands for carbon fiber reinforced plastic. From steel to high tensile steel, you save some 10 to 15 percent, and the saving per kilogram on the bottom line is more or less three pounds per kilogram. If you go to the next one to aluminum, then it's five pounds per kilogram, and you can save up to 40 percent of the body weight. It's getting extremely expensive if you go to carbon fiber, and that is because the technology is so far not used in high volume. It's aeroplanes. Number one, the processes are not yet developed under control. BMW i3 has been launched. They want to ramp up the volume, but it takes some time to get the processes under control to reduce rejects. And once the car then is ready, there's one big difference between aluminum and carbon fiber, namely, Recycling. Aluminum can be recycled 100%. And the bodies nowadays, they are made out of steel, high tensile steel and aluminum. And if you recycle it, then you heat it up. Aluminum is the first one getting liquid, 700 degrees. Then you extract it and you have clean aluminum. Carbon fiber, not yet solved. Not impossible, but it takes some time to solve it. Uh, and Jaguar Land Rover has a long history in aluminum. Range Rover is the first 4x4 off-road being full in aluminum. And there are different body styles which are already on the road or coming shortly. And this is one example uh, of the current Range Rover and the usage of different materials. The body is in aluminum, the colored one in yellow, magnesium, and the red one, aluminum casting for the power domes. There's another area which is chassis, where aluminum chassis gives substantial weight benefit and therefore for the center column, reducing the weight and I did mention parasites earlier as well. 
there is an active driveline system. All Land Rover products are four by four. And on the left-hand side, the power train unit, the engine block in front. On the right-hand side, the rear drive unit. And this short video shows you what's happening inside. In addition, this drive unit gives you the opportunity to do torque vectoring. It disconnects the rear end and you can control the wheels more or less independently. That is what I did mention, 420 kilogram for a new Range Rover, less compared to the previous generation with all the various technologies which are in there. And we have done something similar with steel. Range Rover Evoque is steel and reduced the CO2 emission down to 169 gram with that car. Now, before I end, a few examples, recent, what we have done in research in order to address that challenge. Coming back to the three categories, the propulsion system, the weight, and the parasites, uh, to give you two examples, downsizing, and there's an ultra boost project, which is partly funded by TSB, where for the engineers in the room, the graph here tells more or less everything. It's the black one is the torque curve of a five liter V8 engine today. The green one, three liter, six cylinder. And the blue one is a two liter engine with ultra boost. And it tells what is possible today. You can more or less achieve a five liter performance with a two liter engine adding additional technology. And in absolute terms, it's 283 kilowatt and up to 515 Newton meters. This is the engine built up as a prototype and implemented. <coughs> There's another area with many opportunities that is all the electrical parts in the car in hybrids or in fully electric cars. Uh, the one is electrical engines getting more or less a little bit re resolved or released from extreme high volatile prices on magnetic material, reducing the magnet content, low cost electric drives and the controllers as well. And this one is an activity where we concentrate on I did give you the figures for carbon fiber reinforcement to make that one more or less affordable and reduce it over time with higher volume. There is one area where Jaguar Land Rover has put in a lot of energy, time, money, in order to demonstrate what is currently technically feasible, and that is the CX-75 a hybrid car with a 1.6 liter electrical engine, a battery which is high performing, uh, delivering the energy in an extreme short period of time, a control module which with William's support <coughs> has been derived from Formula One, and electric motors with 160 kilowatt and light weight, 18 kilogram. Mini has currently an electric motor, sorry, I3 of 120 kilowatts with a weight of some 50 kilogram. So that gives you an idea what can be done and how far technology can drive and can support the challenge. Conclusion from our point of view is more or less the next 10, 20, probably even longer, fossil energy will play a major role, number one. Secondly, I've shown you some graphs uh, on energy diversity and the various regulations, and they require 
solutions, and they are usually not simple. They are complex and most likely expensive. <coughs> we have many customers out there. They expect something, and they are demanding, and that is why we have adjusted our focus in research into the five areas which I did mention. And therefore, at the end, My name is Narain Karthikeyan. I've raced all over the globe and mm. driven some of the world's greatest race tracks. Silverstone is one of the nicest race tracks in the world. As a kid, you... you... No, that's real life. Uh, <laughs> 55 minutes ago... Uh, no, sorry. 65 minutes ago it worked. I checked it. I have seen the video. Uh, but somehow it didn't work. Uh, it's a final video which uh, gives you an idea of the products and the global footprint Jaguar Land Rover now is imparting <coughs> on different parts of the world. So, sorry for that one. Real life uh, and sometimes technology does non-deterministic items. Okay, thank you very much. So we have plenty of time to take some questions. It's a very wide-ranging talk. I can't imagine what direction the questions are going to come from, but I'm looking forward to them. I'll take, um, Derek, take this question at the front first, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Wazim, PhD student here at Imperial College. Um, so how do you intend to leverage the shift towards electrification to improve your competitiveness against the big three? I'm not sure whether I've uh, correctly understood uh, the word leverage. Now, what we do is, uh, we have built electric cars as well. Uh, we build up VF activities in battery technology, have built various motors, uh, electrical engines, and sooner or later, we will build an electric car as well. Now, because if you look into 2030, uh, my forecast, our forecast is, in mega cities, there will be a different picture in future in, as far as mobility is concerned. There will be, I'm convinced, a certain percentage of uh, electrical cars. There is a way, there is a step to that one, and that is plug-in hybrids or hybrid cars. They will grow, forecasts are different, though by 2020, somewhere between 14 to 22, 23% of the cars will be hybrid cars, plug-in cars, plug-in hybrid cars. We have hybrid cars as well, that range will be extended. And it's, to a big extent, it starts here. Uh, like, the biggest improvement in fuel economy is the right food of the driver. People don't believe it, but it, that's the fact. And everybody, uh, oh, there are many, many customers, uh, once there is a feedback to the customer in terms of fuel consumption, the behavior changes. Many people driving electric cars uh, spend some energy in order to reduce the energy consumption. If you know exactly how much range you have left or how much energy you just have uh, consumed by pressing the accelerator, that changes behavior of people. And that is something we as users, we need to contribute to that challenge and to that journey using consuming less energy. Hi there, Nick Dimitris from Citigroup. Thank you very much for the talk. I have two points to raise. Um, if your gamble on the XE within the next three to five years pays off, and even if you sell 250,000 cars per year, is that only going to generate 3% income for Tata? And if only, do you see Jaguar Land Rover being consumed by the bigger German companies or coming back to Ford? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
probably the, the second question first, and then keep the microphone, because I, have a, have a, I haven't understood the second word which you said in your first question. Okay. It was two points in one. Yeah. Well, now, uh, the second question, uh, being consumed by the big three. Uh, yeah. Well, it's four, view. big four. Well, maybe four, three, four, three, or, four, or four yes, though, uh, or by somebody else. Though, our clear aspiration is not being consumed by somebody else. Uh, we are small if you compare Jaguar Land Rover in terms of, I did say, 28,000, uh, the big three in Germany, they have at least 100,000 people working there. If you take the volume, 400,000 to one and a half to two million, though we are more or less 25% of them, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of our big advantages because being small uh, also keeps us agile. We can be faster in various areas. Uh, and that is what you will see in the next couple of years. Now, no, there will, we will not be eaten by somebody else. And the first question? It was about 3% increase in tar sales revenue because you had problems in single, West of Bengal, the production. Yes. Uh, do you think it's worthwhile, even if you make the 250,000 pound, 250,000 cars per annum, the XC gamble, if it doesn't pay off, what do you see next for Jaguar Land Rover? Though, the XE is the first car of a new platform. Sure. And that platform will be more or less a surprise for the automotive industry there as well. Uh, if the XE wouldn't pay off, then there are other models coming sub sure, sub sub subsequently. And if you look into the past, uh, the last three, four years, whatever we have put on the market mm. has been successful. Though it's probably the design which people like. I'm it's a big fan of the XO for a good design. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, who else? Ah, got some questions in the center. Uh, uh, take, uh, happen to know Leon. Take Leon first and then the gentleman behind. Could you comment on uh, Tesla's uh, plan to build a gigafactory for these lithium batteries? spending $2 billion, $5 billion, and what, what does that mean for the price of those batteries, and how does, uh, how, what does that mean for the future of electric vehicles? Well, that does not only apply what I'm saying to Tesla. In general, if you have a new technology, then the beginning is small volume, high prices. There are battery plants, manufacturing sites, in the planning, in the making, in different parts of the world. Panasonic has a cell plant. They produce millions of cells daily. The higher the volume, there are two benefits. There's always that curve going down with the volume, the price goes down, because you get the efficiency in the process, in the making. You solve more or less all the defects which are there, and you improve. Voltaic is one example how the price can move over time. And if you look into that Voltaic, which more or less, to my knowledge, originated in Europe with a lot of subsidy from the various governments or cost subsidizing the price of electricity, tremendous boom. And then at some stage, China came in. And China works differently. There is governmental support for plants from manufacturing sites. You get high volume, and the high volume then reduces the price. Uh, the same will happen at some stage with batteries. You reduce with a higher volume the price of batteries. Therefore, if somebody, whether it's Tesla, or X, or Y, or Shell, or BP, or somebody is going to invest in, in batteries, and the consumer demand is growing, that those batteries are built into products and then uh, get into cars, the prices of batteries will go down. How far? Well, they are forecasts, they are experts. They've more or less analyzed the whole process, identified what could be improved, 30, 50% price reduction, yes, price will go down, capacity stimulates 
the consumption then subsequently, and then it's, as with each and every new technology, it's something which is, my view, going to fly. And it's independent of Tesla or whoever it is. Uh, Dr. Rappel, uh, I think you gave a somewhat bad press to fully electric cars, and I'll just try to explain to you uh, from my own experience um, what are the benefits of electric cars. I've actually, we, have, have, we had a look uh, at the kind of journeys that Could we- Could you raise your, your, your arm? I thought, ah, okay. Yeah, uh, we, we had a look at the type of journeys that we do. I live in Hertfordshire. And the majority of the journeys, 90% of our yearly journeys are short journeys, either going locally or coming into London. Uh, today, I came from Hertfordshire to London. I've got a small, fully electric car. That's uh, the one produced by Volkswagen. Uh, on the return journey, it used half of the energy which is stored in the battery. So there is no energy anxiety at all, or, or range anxiety. The car charges overnight. Uh, my supplier is good energy, which produces all this electricity from wind power. I've got solar panels, which I use occasionally to, to charge up the car during daytime. The car, that car costs 7,000 pounds more than the top of the range petrol car. And from the savings, actually, uh, the, the journey to, to, uh, to London costs 50p in terms of electricity use. Yes. So I'm going to get, if we want to talk about finances as well, never mind the fact that I am having a zero pollution car. Yes, yes. Uh, within three and a half years, I would actually make up, in terms of fuel non-used, the cost of the extra, the extra cost of the car that I've got. Mm -hmm. So I would yeah. like you to comment on, uh, on this situation. You know, mm -hmm. I think that the electric cars now uh, can provide an excellent non-polluting use for the vast majority of city dwellers. Yes. Now, uh, I must apologize if I have generated the perception that uh, electric car is something which is not good. That, that is what I heard from you in the beginning. Now, what, what I wanted to say with the example of, of the battery and the fuel is there is a tremendous difference in energy content between fuel and battery. That is physical fact. Electric, my personal view, can more or less electric car today, 70, 80% of all the daily travels can be done electrically because mostly people commute a short distance or a reasonable distance. In average, people are buying a car, a big car, because they go on holiday a few times, a handful of times of the year, or visiting family with children, where they travel bigger distances, more than 500 kilometers or 300 miles. 90 plus, 95 percent of commuting is short distances. Now, you did travel how many miles today? 40 miles today, 20 miles here, 21 miles. Yeah. Now, 40 miles is something, or uh, up to US currently, the figure is around 120, 130 miles, 85% uh, travel less than the 120 miles daily. And that is something which can be covered with a battery, with an el electric car. What I wanted to express, in order to get to that situation that more electric cars are there, we need to change our behavior. We need to accept that the car travels only a certain amount of, of distance. Uh, it's the perception that we need more, but reality, as you demonstrate, and you say that is what you do, once you own an electric car, or you drive an electric car for some time, you suddenly notice that it covers most of your requirements. And we need to find solutions, and there's BMW in Germany, they offer an i3, and you get access uh, five times or six times a year to another car where you then can make your holiday travel or visit your family or whatever it is. And from a technology point of view, <laughs> we are providing, though, and our colleagues in, in other companies, they provide, they offer uh, that opportunity 
it's the customer at the end who decides whether that is going to survive or to succeed, yes or no. And we all hope and support that BMW, VW, Nissan, that they have a big success in the market. Because that then helps us really to reduce our fuel consumption or our CO2 production. Yeah, no, sorry for that one. That was not my intention to say electric is not good. And uh, I didn't know that uh, you did say three years you need to amortize. How many years do you need to amortize to pay back? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yes, okay. three and a half years, okay. excellent. Let me move on, because we're a bit tight for time. I'll take one question from the front. The microphone's just on its way. Thank you, hello. My name is Adam Chase from E4Tech. We're a consulting firm. Um, a question about policy. If you go back in the case of Europe about 10 years ago, we had voluntary agreement on CO2, and in the US we had CAFE and so on. And arguably they were really not doing anything in terms of stimulating innovation. When Europe actually said, right, enough is enough, we're going to have firm binding targets and they have firm binding regulation instead of voluntary targets, suddenly there was this burst of innovation. Well, certainly that's the story that most people feel is the case. Mm. Would you accept, um, as I think the automotive industry wasn't prepared to do at the time the regulation came in, that actually regulation has been a positive force for the industry and has actually stimulated a great deal of innovation? No. Generically, <laughs> pressure generates uh, heat and heat generates ideas movement. Each and every system, whether that's a political system, an economic system, a technical system, that is the underlying law. Um, automotive industry has been slow, reluctant, uh, not because of missing ideas. I think the primary driver was cost. Because you put a new technology into the product and there's a cost. And nobody wanted to go the step fully electrically, though Prius has been the first one more or less with big volume, putting in two drivetrains an electrical motor, a combustion engine, a tank, and a battery, and the controller. Two systems roughly cost double the price of one system. Now in order somehow to get that into the market, they have saved some money. If you look in the trim of the car, it's different. If you compare that to a car with the same price with only one, propulsion system, then you get more interior for that one. Uh, and Toyota most likely has extreme, has had extreme small contribution margin out of that one because they considered it as being a facilitator and enabler for them in terms of technology innovation. Though it can, technically it shows it can be done but there is a price to that one, and if you put then an electric car in the market and a conventional one, and the, the one is not only 7,000, but 10 or 12,000 more expensive, then the question is whether that is accepted. And that was the reluctance of the automotive industry. But the regulation leveled the playing field. Yes, because then everybody needed to do it. Uh, and if then suddenly the price is more or less going up on the field, more or less for all players in the field, then it's something which, yes, you said leveling the playing field, but it's higher cost at the end or higher price. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to, in a moment, invite you to uh, join us in the foyer for a drinks reception and, and take an opportunity to look at some of the demonstrations and uh, posters that, that some of our researchers across the campus have, have provided. But um, my final duty, I think, is to thank very warmly 
uh, Wolfgang for his very interesting talk. I think you talked with um, calm authority on a very wide range of topics and, and then brought that also to the answers to a wide range of, of questions. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.